And what we're really interested in understanding is to, um, to, to study how the cancer spreads to other organs, so how it metastasizes, how does uh, it grow or not in those organs, um, and how can we stop that process. So this is more or less the illustration of um, our lab. We tackle this challenge using breast cancer as a model, and um, this, this cancer frequently metastasizes to places like the lung, the liver, the bone, or the brain. And all these places really influence the disease progression. And all of these mystery boxes um, have disseminated tumor cells in them that interact with these unique mi microenvironments. Uh, how this interaction occurs, we're still unraveling. And uh, today, what I'm going to show you is a story on one particular site, the liver, and how the players in that liver, especially the immune context of that liver, are really important for deciding whether the disease unleashes or stays um, dormant. So the reason really why I'm interested and motivated to do this is that metastasis is still a burden and it causes over 90% of the cancer-related death. Now, why these numbers are so high is that for a given patient, we really struggle to understand whether this patient is going to metastasize or present with a metastasis. If so, when is that going to occur? And if so, why? This can take months, years, decades in some patients. This means that um, before these metastases pop up in this life of, the, of those patients, there has to be a phase where some disseminated tumor cells shed out from the primary site and went to secondary places and just stay there in a state that we call dormancy. So this is really a challenge because either of these cells represent a potential threat to the life of those patients. Now, evidence of that threat really comes from the fact that already at the time of diagnosis, one-third of the patients uh, with breast cancer are also diagnosed with micrometastases in their bones. But this is only what we sample. If we go and look at cases of rapid autopsy samples, we will see that in other organs, there would be uh, very many disseminated tumor cells that were just there, sitting in those organs in those patients, and they just didn't cause uh, the death of those patients within that lifetime frame. Now, this also tells you that this phase uh, of dormancy can evolve to indeed cause a metastasis. Um, and when we try to, to treat this metastasis, it's often very inefficient. Now, my invitation to you today is really to focus uh, on interfering on this phase where the patient is still asymptomatic, but already carries those disseminated tumor cells that are potential threats to the life of that patient. So how do we do this intervention? We got to know what determines the dormancy um, of that cell or, or the potential to initiate a metastasis. And as a community, we all agree that the initial genetic background of that disseminated tumor cell really matters. We just uh, heard uh, today from Gerard that it indeed uh, matters quite a lot. Now, there are cells that we have loaded of gen with genetic abnormalities in those secondary sites and even some that mingle within our normal and homeostatic uh, tissues, and they just don't grow. So they don't grow for a very long time. And I think that must tell us that there is something that by default is repressive of that growth. I would argue that is actually a more dominant force for that, um, for that process of dormancy. Now, one other thing that we started listening yesterday uh, from Shaheen Rafi was this issue of not all organs are the same. They have a different architecture, they have different resident cell types, they have a different physiology. And this means that all of these different components and this organ specificity is going to reflect on the fate of those disseminated tumor cells. So combining these two considerations, um, the research 
the research question that I'm really interested in, in understanding and answering is this one. What are the tissue-specific determinants of breast cancer dormancy? How did I go about this? I basically wanted to see uh, a progression of those cells. I wanted to see them in a live animal. So I built a reporter that would allow me to track those cells. The reporter is basically a fluorophore, a tomato um, that labels all the tumor cells in conjunction with a reporter that uh, is an M venous fluorescent protein attached to a P27, which basically identifies cells that at a given time are in the quiescent state, so they're not dividing. Using these two reporters, you can actually distinguish these two fates of the cell either those that are cycling in any phase of the cycle or those that are really in G0, quiescent, arrested in cell cycle. Now, if you pick these reporters, put them in cells, uh, and put those cells in mammary glands of mice, they grow tumors. We can take those tumors out, and we can um, wait until metastasis pop up or not. And we can indeed uh, look at uh, many different organs, and using a flow cytometry approach, oh, sorry about that, um, that should not be black. Um, using a flow cytometry approach, we can distinguish the, the disseminated tumor cell compartment, either those that are cycling in any time of the, the cycle, or those that are double positive and so quiescent for a given time and also distinguish the stroma or all the microenvironment that is uh, next to those neighbors. Now, if you survey the organs uh, in a mouse, um, you would appreciate that the burden, so the amount of disseminated tumor cells here represented in red, is really quite variable, which is not surprising. We know that tissues do have a preference uh, for metastasis or not. And what was more surprising to me was the fact that if you only look at disseminated tumor cells uh, that are quiescent, you would see that they mainly pop up in the liver, which is, as we heard, one of the most frequent sites of metastasis. So this got me really interested. Um, and I wanted to see, again, uh, how they really um, um, spread within a liver lobe. So this is an example of one of those liver lobes. You can appreciate a metastasis foci down here in an otherwise apparently disease-free organ. Now, if you dig deeper in the organ, you'll see that there are many places within it that have these disseminated tumor cells that are double positive for the, the two reporters, which means that they are quiescent in that time. I think this is a beautiful example because within the same organ, the same liver lobe, you have these two uh, disease stages that are quite different. So what does that cell that initiated this metastasis do that is different than this one? Or is there any difference around the environment that those cells had that actually made them grow differently? So to understand this second part, I basically chopped up the liver in different parts, and I took the constituent cells from each of those parts and used the flow using the flow cytometry approach that I described before. And for all those parts and populations, I did RNA sequencing to see what they were expressing. For the sake of time, I'm only going to show you what the microenvironment in that liver is uh, expressing, and what we saw Oh, this is really bad looking, but so there is um, a contrast in these two different, in these two populations, either those that represent metastatic liver um, stroma or the ones that represent dormancy uh, liver stroma. And within the um, dormancy stroma uh, in the liver, we saw mostly signatures enriched of host defense uh, processes, especially those that would relate to natural killer cell mediated cytotoxicity, immunity, um, uh, in general, an NK cell phenotype that was enriched there. So this was just a hypothesis generation. And at the time, I knew no immunology. I'm as scared of that as Gerard. <laughs> 
Um, but still, I dig deeper, and I try to immune profile all the immune cell subsets that I could uh, see in the liver at the time. And there was only one that was changing and increasing in dormancy samples, and that was indeed the natural killer cells of the liver. Now, this population would dramatically decrease upon metastasis. Now, to really see whether this was the causation of the effect that we were seeing, we wanted to modulate these uh, NK cells specifically. And uh, to do that, we went again in vivo, and we used depletion, uh, we used several different methods, but one was the depletion of natural killer cells with an antibody, and for activation, we use an IL-15 immunotherapy-based approach. What we could see was that the depletion of natural killer cells really in, uh, increased the number of metastases, while really remarkably, IL-15 immunotherapy as an adjuvant setting, so after we removed the tumor, was um, sufficient to prevent hepatic metastases. Now, one thing I want to point out is that we didn't get rid of the tumor cells that were still dormant. So they were still there, as in the example that you can see um, over here, even under IL-15 therapy. But it was really remarkable to see that when we looked at the survival of those mice that were under IL-15 therapy, that survival was really extended. So we were really preventing those metastases from causing the death of the mice. Now, how does this happen? How do NK cells control dormant disseminated tumor cells? And the general idea in the field is that the NK cell really recognizes inhibitory or activatory receptors within the surface of the disseminated tumor cells. And um, based on, on that repertoire, it would kill or spare a tumor cell. Now, we looked at the repertoire of these activatory and in inhibitory receptors at the cell surface of either cycling or quiescent DTCs, and we found really uh, very little difference. So that couldn't explain our phenotype. We also thought that there could be a differential um, cytotoxicity uh, sensitivity, but also we found no differences according to the cell cycle stage. So I had to look for yet another possibility. I went unbiased, and I took out natural killer cells from either metastatic dormancy or no tumor liver uh, uh, samples. And we did, again, RNA sequencing on those sorted populations. And what popped out was basically in those dormant um, NK cells, cytokine-associated genes, mainly interferon gamma and TNF-alpha. Now, we could only validate that um, the percentage of interferon gamma positive cells was increased in dormancy um, in different models and not the uh, enrichment for TNF-alpha, as it hinted from the RNA-seq. To really see whether the interferon gamma was then the mediator of the phenotype of um, induced quiescence we were actually watching, I turned to culture models, where indeed you can uh, study uh, direct effects of, uh, of this or any other cytokine. So what I tried to do was to kind of create a liver-like milieu in a dish by using hepatocytes as a confluent monolayer. Um, and in there, I seeded um, cancer cells very sparsely on top to mimic the seeding in vivo, and I treated those uh, with interferon gamma or not. And at the end of the, of the treatment, we would look at how many quiescent and how many cycling cells we would have using our reporter. What we could see in different models, again, was that the treatment with interferon gamma really skewed those cells towards becoming more quiescent. So it looked like it was the mediator um, of the, the phenotype we were seeing. Altogether, um, I want to say that we unraveled this um, new activity of the NK cells, which went enough uh, in, the, um, in the liver stroma. They produced this interferon gamma cytokine, and so this is the mediator of this quiescence of the, the DTCs. 
Now, you may ask what happens then when the metastasis really grows. So what is it that is messing up with the natural killer cell compartment over time? And I, to address that, I went back to the um, RNA sequencing data that we had, and I saw that in the metastasis samples of the liver, there were a lot of um, extracellular matrix proteins, uh, protein genes like collagen, helixes, uh, smooth muscle actin, trangelin, all of these that seem to be identifiers of a particular cell in the liver that when it gets activated, so this is the hepatic cell itself, that when it gets activated, uh, basically starts having all these identifiers. So um, you heard also about these cells from Gerard this, this morning. I just wanted to point out that we indeed find that there is an accumulation of these cells as we see metastases popping up, and they are not activated. I'm sorry again for the contrast, it's not looking so nice, but they're not activated um, in the dormancy state. We also saw an accumulation of collagen deposition uh, in metastases, but not while, those, um, while around those disseminated tumor cells that were not growing. Now, to really know whether this activation of stellate cells was, was the push for those disseminated tumor cells um, to awaken, I used the same uh, model that Gerard also talked uh, today about, based on uh, CCL4. And what we saw was that when under treatment, those levers uh, showed up with more uh, metastasis. And these metastases were correlated with um, a drop in NK cell percentage and number. And this drop really stemmed from a lack of division or less pro proliferation of those natural killer cells. So something that a, the accumulation of the activated hepatic stellate cells is really inhibiting the NK compartment and we wanted to know what, what, what was that. So to, fish, to fish for that, we again turn to culture models. And because the liver has a lot of paracrine signaling and hepatic stellate cells are, are masters in, in, in playing a role in there, I hypothesized that there could be something that those stellate cells were secreting that would mess up with the expansion of natural killer cells. We tested that. And indeed, the condition media from uh, cultures with either uh, hepatic cell, uh, activated hepatic stellate cells alone or in combination with hepatocytes actually pushed NK cells not to proliferate further. Now, what is it that is in this secretome of those stellate cells? To fish for that, we did proteomics analysis on those condition media. And what we found as the top hit was the cytokine called CXL12. Now, some of you in the audience might know this um, from the hematopoietic stem cell field. It's one of those cytokines that uh, controls the traffic of uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And in the marrow, it really pushes uh, hematopoietic stem cells to stay quiescent. Tumor cells that disseminate and go and lodge in the marrow use the same kind of mechanisms to go there and stay dormant. So I wonder that maybe what CXCL12 was doing here was also pushing NK cells into staying quiescent in the liver niche. So I first confirmed that this receptor, that is the receptor for CXCL12, CXCR4, um, is present in NK cells, both from mice and humans. And what we did next was basically to uh, collect activated hepatic stellate cells pick up their secretome and throw it on natural killer cells with or without an antibody against CXL12. And we could see that under that, um, uh, under the use of the antibody of CXL12, we could rescue that quiescence of, of NK cells. So it seemed to be the mediator of this push towards staying arrested. So all in all, uh, there is some sort of tissue injury that here we modeled using the CCL4, for example, that pushes these hepatic stellate cells towards an activated state that makes them then 
secretes CXL12 that interacts with CXCR4 at the surface of natural killer cells and pushes those towards quiescence. There is also another part of the story, which I won't have time to talk to you about today, which is that CXL12 also feeds directly to uh, cancer cells, and in there it pushes them towards proliferation. So it's the perfect combination for that metastasis to unleash. I want to leave you with a final note on the clinical significance, as this is really important to us. Um, and that is that our data points that interferon gamma therapy might be uh, useful when repurposed to earlier stages of the disease uh, and, in, and still keep those dormant cells in check. The second thing is that CXCR4 inhibition therapy might work to unleash the natural killer cell compartment and make them proliferative again and good enough to control the disease. And lastly, that NK cell immunity might be really important and not only in the liver um, to, to be the check to basically decide whether uh, those disseminated tumor cells are going to grow or not. That goes to the final note that along with natural killer cells, we have um, mechanisms in our organism that act to suppress actively disseminated tumor cells and tumor cells in general from growing throughout our life. And what I really want to do now is really to find those mechanisms and use that as a, a new adjuvant therapy setting for preventing metastatic disease. Last but not least, this work was still done when I was back in Switzerland, and here's to all the, a big thank you to everyone that was part of, of this work. Now I'm here. Um, I have a very good micro environment, <laughs> uh, both in the lab and with the lab members that I have so far. This is just um, the connection for our website if you want to know more about us. I also want to thank the funders, you all for your attention, and with that I'll take any questions.